right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, Susan, I will let you um, begin and do an introduction and then we'll get into the training. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us for this training on strategies for providing services in alignment with the home and community based services. Uh, HCBS final rule. My name is Susan Crow from the Department of Developmental Services in the Federal Programs Division. In alignment with the California Statewide Transition Plan and the state's efforts to comply with the requirements of the final rule, the department contracted with Public Consulting Group, uh, who will introduce themselves in a moment, but they're the wonderful people you see here in this webinar, uh, to facilitate trainings and provide guidance on a variety of topics relating to the final rule. So these topics have included an overview of the final rule, uh, person-centered planning practices, and how to complete the provider self-assessment. All previous trainings uh, were recorded and can be found on the department's website. I'll um, see if I can send that link in the chat in a minute here. Um, today's training topic will focus on the intent of the HCBS final rule, the importance of person-centered planning and implementing practices that consider both in the way services are provided. The department is committed to working with individuals receiving services and their families service providers, advocates, and regional centers to come into compliance with the HCBS final rule. Future training announcements regarding person-centered practices uh, will be posted to the department's website. If you haven't already signed up, you can send an email to our HCBS inbox and get on the list to receive updates about HCBS in California. Uh, this email is provided at the end of the presentation, but we can also put that into the Q&A as well. Again, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to our trainers, Public Consulting Group. Thanks, Susan. So again, thank you all for attending this training today. Um, we're going to begin with a few training expectations. Um, first, just to let everyone know that this training is being recorded and will be posted to the DDS website. We will also send out the training slide deck as well so that you can access that. Um, we do ask that if you have questions to use the Q&A function in WebEx for questions specifically related to this training content. Um, because of the volume of training participants, we may not be able to answer all of the questions received during the webinar. However, we did receive a lot of questions through registration, and we have those questions built into the training content itself. Um, and if we have time at the end, we'll take some additional questions. If you have um, additional questions that we do not address in the training, you can send them to that email address, hcbsregs at dds.ca.gov. You can also access live closed captioning through the multimedia viewer. Throughout the training, we'll be using interactive polls. And before the first poll, I will give you all instructions on um, how to uh, begin those. So for some brief introductions, as Susan said, we are a public consulting group. We have Amanda Alvey, Elsa Bach, Jamie Cohen, and Kathy Anderson all on the training today. Um, you may recognize some of us from previous trainings that Susan just mentioned, which are posted to the DDS website. We've been working with um, states across the country on coming into alignment with the final rule and are looking forward to this training with California today. Some objectives of this training specifically, training participants will come away from this training with an understanding of the timeline for aligning practices with the final rule, person-centered practices as the foundation of the final rule, shared strategies to align practices, frequently asked questions and answers, which again will be um, included throughout the training, and then we'll talk next steps. And here's the agenda. We will give a brief overview of the final rule, talk about person-centered practices, and then we'll talk about each federal requirement and some strategies to align practices. Again, we'll talk about next steps. We have some resources for you all to share, and then we have an exit survey. So to begin with the brief overview of the HCBS settings final rule, so the HCBS regulations focus on people's experiences and opportunities 
And the best source of understanding the intent of the final rule is really the introduction of the regulations, particularly the section where um, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, responds to many of the comments received during the rulemaking process. And as you can see on the slide, um, the two purposes listed here are to ensure that individuals receiving services through HCBS programs have full access to the benefits of community living and to further expand the opportunities for meaningful community integration in support of the goals of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Supreme Court decision in Olmstead. And we're now going to have our first poll because we want to invite participants in this training to add thoughts on why you think um, the HCBS final rule is so important. So this next slide will give you instructions on actually how to join the first poll. So you can either go to the website here, pollev.com and enter Jamie Cohen 281. You can also use your mobile phone to text the number 22333. And the code that you text is that Jamie Cohen 281. So I will give everyone just a few moments here to join the poll. The next slide with the first poll will also have instructions on how to join. Okay. So this first poll asks, why do you think it's important to align services with the HCBS final rule? And again, up here at the top, you respond um, pollev.com backslash Jamie Cohen 281 um, or by text. Some of the words I'm seeing up here, I see compliance, services, quality, funding, independence, excellence, benefits, consumers. And the larger words are the ones that have been submitted multiple times. Great. Thank you, everyone. So next we're going to talk about what California's next steps are to coming into alignment with the final rule. So through the process described in California's statewide transition plan, California must assure that all providers of HCBS compensated through any of the Medicaid HCB authorities are fully compliant with the requirements of the final rule by March 2023. And this slide here shows California's specific process, um, which we just want to include as a high level overview. And um, number three here, the assessment process, including consumer input throughout um, is where we're focusing on today with the self assessments um, and next steps from there in terms of uh, strategies to align practices. And California DDS has been engaged in a collaborative process with stakeholders to achieve compliance with the final rule. The process began with the work to develop the initial statewide transition plan, the development of the provider self assessment process, um, which the self assessments were due August 31st, um, just about a month ago now. Um, and all states must be in full compliance with the final rule by uh, March 2023. This next slide shows a few dates um, for the process to align the practices with the final rule. Um, and a note here about remediation. So remediation isn't, there isn't a formal timeline attached to that. 
while remediation activities have to be completed in time for the state to validate alignment with the final rule, activities can begin as soon as the provider self identifies any area where there can be improvement um, and remediation is a work in progress and more guidance and technical assistance will be forthcoming. So, again, just wanted to show this slide to give a high level overview of the process, the timeline um, before we dive into. Talking through those strategies to align practices. And if you attended um, and completed the self assessment, uh, these federal requirements should look familiar. The self assessment um, was divided into these 10 federal requirements. And when, when we talk about the strategies to align practices, we'll talk about them by each federal requirement broken down here. So with that, we are going to have another poll. We want everyone on this training to reflect on your own current practices. So this next poll asks, throughout the assessment process, have you identified any challenges or barriers to align practices with the requirements of the HCBS settings final rule? And some of the potential challenges or barriers may be staffing patterns, access to transportation, education, training, technical assistance, understanding service definitions, um, budget funding, licensing requirements, or if there's another challenge or barrier that you run into, you can select other, um, or if you've found the no barriers or challenges, you can select that there. Looks like around 23% said education, 19% licensing requirements, 19% said staffing patterns, 12% said access to transportation, 15% understanding service definitions, 8% budget slash funding. We have one more poll to kick off this training, and this is a different question. So we just talked about challenges, challenges and strategies. Now we're asking about, or sorry, challenges and barriers. Now we're going to ask about strategies or next steps. So throughout the assessment process, have you identified any strategies or next steps to align practices? Looks like we see 32% said staffing patterns, 8% said access to transportation. 32% um, education, 12% understanding service definitions, 19% said budget and funding. So with that, um, today we're really going to be addressing uh, some more of what those strategies and next steps are um, so that you feel fully equipped to align your practices with the final rule. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Kathy Anderson to um, first ground this conversation and talking about person-centered practices. Thanks, Jamie. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. We appreciate um, the participation this afternoon. It looks like we've got over a thousand participants, so it's just pretty overwhelming to think about. Um, we just wanted to make sure that people understood with regard to person-centered practices that we're all currently being forced to make changes in our own lives at the same time that we're making changes in the lives of the people that use services and supports. All of a sudden, what's important for all of us is to avoid the spread of COVID-19 and to support others to avoid the spread or even to deal with active infection and all that entails. Um, and, you know, should they contract the virus? Um, the needs for services and supports have not changed, even though all the structures we have traditionally supported people in have changed dramatically. Person-centered practice is the foundation in times of crisis or not. So on this first slide here, when we talk about person-centeredness, we list for you both person-centered thinking, which is a way of thinking that helps create the means and resources for a person to live a life that they value. And then the other important concept is person-centered planning, which is the process and a document. It's a way to assist people needing um, home and community-based services and supports to construct and describe what they want and need to bring purpose and meaning to their lives. And then person-centered practice, which is a much broader term, is the alignment 
of those service resources that give people access to the full benefit of community living and ensure that they receive services in a way that may help them achieve individual goals. It incorporates both person-centered thinking and person-centered planning. Um, so we're going to delve a little um, bit um, deeper into person-centeredness. Um, all strategies and examples for aligning services and um, practices and services start with strong person-centered planning. We focus on the foundational beliefs of person-centeredness. Many of these conversations occur on a daily basis between direct support staff and the individuals they serve. We need, to ensure many, we need to ensure that these conversations are being documented and ultimately reflected in the individual plan and most importantly in the daily lives of the people that you're supporting. The implementation of these rules may not be as hard as you think it is if we use those ordinary interactions and conversations as learning opportunities to figure out what good support looks like for an individual. So this doesn't have to be a contrived process. It really should be something that is natural and helps in the fact that you're getting to know a person or as you know a person, as the person changes, you get to know what is different in their life. From person-centered planning to person-centered to person-centered thinking and then to person-centered practice. Um, individuals' needs like um, and likes may change. As we know, that has happened um, to many of us um, on a daily basis, um, certainly more frequently as we've adjusted to the new environments. Staff learning should be ongoing and we need to ensure that information is carried down to the direct support professionals. So it's important that this just isn't something that's documented for administrative staff. It is something that is very important that the people who are having the touch with the person, and I mean that eye to eye, um, maybe not so much physical touch these days, but that contact with the person on an ongoing basis really knows and understands this information. Um, as I said, implementing person-centered planning, it's an ongoing conversation and communication. The individual, um, one of the requirements is that the individual will lead the person-centered process when possible, and that is as part of the federal regulation. It doesn't um, necessarily require new resources, um, but it may require a change in your practice, um, and it means some more flexibility and better use, um, better use of what resources we have available to accomplish this goals. Um, again, you know, we need to make sure that with staffing, we are um, making sure there's ongoing training and guidance and support for staff, that we have, as many of you mentioned in the poll, reassess your staffing models. There's had to be a number of changes in staffing models, not only due to the pandemic, but also due to new practices and then access to plans in all settings. By that, we mean that the individual program plan is something that um, staff have access to. So it's not just this document that's developed and it's set aside, but it is in fact um, used and, and staff are knowledgeable about it. And then any supporting policies must be reflective of person-centered practice. And I'm just looking through my notes to make sure. Um, we want to reassess staffing models to examine policies and procedures or practices that require um, staff to always have eyes on people in the environment. Are there opportunities for people to have time alone? Is technology available and used to support a person versus always having staff there? Determine if staff can be deployed in such a way to support one-on-one -on -one activities and not just group activities. I think that that's a change in many instances. Reassessing staffing models is taking a look at how you do things now. It's not always about hiring more staff. It's about reassessing how current staff are deployed. Can you adjust schedules? After evaluating what changes need to take place in your current staffing models, we recommend talking to your regional center and seeing what options and resources are available to you. Uh, 
Um, there was also a letter um, to the state Medicaid directors in March of 29 that talked about heightened scrutiny and specifically mentioned um, staffing models. So we'll have that listed as a resource for you to take a look at that. And um, if, if, if you have any, if anyone on the training has questions, you should talk directly to your regional center staff about how this can be accomplished and what you need to do to achieve changes. Some states have been reviewing and changing staffing schedules, trying to incorporate designated one-to-one -one time for all people. And um, states are also examining their policies with regard to internet access, supervision, training, and support to use technology is just a few of the areas. So we have, I think, the next slide. Yep, and just so everyone knows, I have seen in the Q&A, people have some questions about the poll. We only have one more poll. Um, it will have the instructions on how to join at the very top. Um, it is filling up quickly because we have over 1,000 participants on. Um, so we apologize for that. But if you do have additional thoughts on this, you can feel free to email those to us. Um, but we do have one more poll here. And the instructions on how to join are up at the top, the poll EV dot com backslash Jamie Cohen 281. And the question is, what are some examples of how you have been implementing person centered planning and practices? And again, if the poll does fill up, um, you can feel free to uh, send those to us by email. And Jamie, we're seeing another um, choice words coming on the screen that people are um, texting in or are sending in through the poll, right? Yep. Suddenly I just forgot the name from the word Scrabble. <laughs> yeah, I see asking questions, training, meetings, becoming certified in PCT training, treating each client needs and services as an individual, speaking to families, asking residents more questions, training, training, talking to the person asking his needs and wants, ISP meetings, giving choices, team meetings, meetings, interviewing, virtual clubhouse, client input, wants and needs, wants and need, in-service training. All right. Thank you all again for participating. Um, one more, before we move on, I just want to let everyone know too, there's been some questions about downloading the PowerPoint. If you're not able to get it through WebEx, we will email it out um, after this training to everyone. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I think as you could see from the um, words that people were using, that people really staffing, as you had indicated in the earlier polls, has really been a big issue. But there's been some creativity and innovation. And um, it, of course, always makes us uh, feel great when you talk about training, because training is really important. But I think even better when you talk about speaking with the individuals that you're supporting and listening to them, really important. And that really as is at the heart of being person-centered and doing person-centered thinking. So on this next slide, we're talking about modifications um, that might take place. Um, so it says if there's a specific and individualized assessed need, then there, would, there could be a modification. Um, there should be positive interventions and supports used prior to any modifications being put in Place. So if you're modifying what would be common practice or typical practice, 
um, for a person in a person's life. You must also document that there are less intrusive methods of meeting the need um, that the person has um, that have been tried but did not work. So you can't just automatically go to something that is very restrictive. You need to make sure that you have tried to find the least restrictive thing that would work too and the least intrusive to work with a person. And then there needs to be a clear description of the condition or the behavior or whatever it is that is causing um, their need, the need for the modification, and that it needs to be directly proportionate to the specific assessed need of the person. So if you're going to do a modification, it can't just be that you're going, you know, it's kind of like going from zero to 100 miles an hour. You want to increase what that modification might be or that restriction might be in a very thoughtful way and make sure it's measured. Um, the, any modification, again, in 42 CFR, um, we ha will have the citation for you. Um, if there are additional conditions for provider owned and controlled residential settings, they must be supported by a specific assessed need and justified in the person-centered plan. So it's very clear about that. Um, and I think I just talked through um, that also the person or their legal representative, if they have one, must provide written approval of the modification. This approval must be based on a fair explanation of the procedures to be followed, including an identification of those which are experimental, should that be the process, a description of the attendant discomforts and risks. So are there discomforts or risks associated with the intervention? Um, what are the descriptions of the benefits expected from this, this modification? You have to also do a disclosure of the appropriate alternative procedures together with an explanation of the respective benefits, discomforts, and risks, as we've mentioned. Um, offer and offer to answer any inquiries regarding the procedure. So if a person gets the information in writing, or if you go over it verbally, you also must end that discussion by saying you will meet with them and discuss it further to make sure they have complete and comprehensive understanding of it. And there should always be a statement that withholding or withdrawal of consent um, will not prejudice the future provision of appropriate services and supports to an individual. So in other words, if the person or their legal representative changes their mind, that is not a reason or an acceptable reason to terminate services or to make some other kind of dramatic changes, you again need to engage in the conversation about this modification. Great. Um, so Kathy, you started to talk about this and I was wondering if you could answer this question. What are best practice strategies for maintaining a person-centered approach through remote services? Well, um, I'll throw some ideas, some of which I'm sure are you've all thought of, but um, some of which um, you may be using, um, but be sure to take the time to meet with the person one-on-one. -on -one. Um, get to know them. This can be done in many, many ways. Um, I think as we all have learned um, through Zoom, through FaceTime, via the plain old telephone that we uh, used to rely on a lot more than we did our computers, and any other use of technology um, if you can't do it in person. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do in person, but if people are more remote and you can't, you have to think about and be creative about the technology, not only that they have access to, but that is um, available to them. Make sure you're finding out what the person's interests, likes, dislikes, goals, wishes, desires are, and that can be done, again, as I mentioned, informally, and then through the use of assessment tools to guide the discussion and conversation. It can be a formal process, it also can be an informal process, but remember that if you're getting information, you're ascertaining information from a person, you need to write it down and make sure you can collect it and share it with others. Um, make sure that you explore um, with the person their interests. You know, for example, um, the, like if a person wants to 
says that they're interested in law enforcement or being a policeman. What is it specifically about that that interests them? Um, or if they want child care, is it they want to work in child care? Is it because they like children or they think it's a, a more fun or easygoing? Or you just really need to explore that. Don't just, if somebody mentions one thing, don't either rule it in or rule it out. Explore it. It's really important to make sure that you do that. You know, what are their experience that caused this interest? Um, you know, like if it's a florist, do they like flowers? Do they like to grow things? Have they never had the opportunity to grow things? So there's a lot of ways to explore the um, interest and a lot of detail to pull on out of the person about it, because it could be that then it might lead to some other career exploration or other job opportunities. Get to know the person over time too. What makes them happy, what sad, frustrated, um, you know, that isn't the same every day, every morning, every evening is not the same for a person. So you have to talk with them throughout the day. Um, how, how does a person like to spend time alone? Um, do they like being alone? Um, some people don't really ever like to be alone, but some people do need more alone time than we're often aware of. And so we may need to make sure that we're aware of that. Are they a morning person or a late night person? Um, do they have staff preferences for female or male staff? Um, or do they, there's a certain person that works um, with them that they really have hit it off with and is that their preferred person to um, have most of their interactions? And um, do not only, um, do, don't do all activities in groups, um, they can, be, um, you need to make sure that there's individualization and personalization. I mean, it is um, appropriate sometimes group activities and learning to get along with others and those kinds of things. But we also need to recognize that we all as individuals um, do things independently and on our own. And so we need to um, apply that to the people that are being supported. So now we're going to talk about some strategies to align practices with the final rule. Um, the barriers and challenges that we're going to talk about are examples of issues we have seen from other self-assessment work that we've completed both in California and um, for some different populations and with some of the other states we do work in. These also come from questions and feedback we've received from stakeholders, um, the HCBS work group, program evaluators at the regional centers and questions from previous trainings and ones we've received in our email box and surveys. So while when you see these barriers, when we go to the next slide, they may not be an exact one-to-one -one for you. That may not be the barriers that you, you have experienced, but we have drawn these from real life experience. So hopefully they have some applicability to you. So just a few thoughts to keep in mind while the ongoing implementation of the HCBS final rule continues during the pandemic. Um, I think it's really important that the guiding concepts noted in the final rule, um, the really overarching one is to ensure individuals receive services in the community to the same degree of access as individuals not receiving Medicaid home and community-based services. So as we all know, this has really changed for many of us in our communities. And so it has changed for the people that we support. Um, as a result of the stay-at-home order, we've had required to make changes in our lives, our choices and opportunities to experience our communities have been limited or curtailed. These restrictions are not because the person has IDD, but because we have all had to make lifestyle changes to ensure health and safety. So again, it's the same as you and I, it's not different. Um, and we shouldn't be really thinking about it as different. Again, it's only different when you individualize it. What about that particular person makes a restriction or a change have to be put in place. High quality comprehensive person-centered planning is the foundation in the delivery of services in times of crisis or otherwise. Knowing the interests and strengths and needs of the people you are supporting is always essential. 
Individuals' need for services and supports have not changed during this time, but the approaches, settings, and staffings, staffing may have um, that we may have used have traditionally supported people have changed, um, and that's because of, of things that were beyond most of our control. So we'll go now to the next slide. So if you look at um, Again, here is access to the community. This is one, I think we even had a question before we got started about access, um, person having access to other people. And um, here on the challenges and barriers side, we looked at, we talked about the lack of employment opportunities, limited interest in leaving the home. People haven't been interested once they've gotten kind of uh, nestled into their home, they've not wanted to go. And then there are limited transportation options also. So on the right side of the screen, you'll see some strategies. You know, community is referring to the places where you live, work and recreate. So the community isn't just going downtown. The community is your access to um, much broader um, array of supports and services. Um, again, as I said earlier, knowing and understanding a person's goals, desires, and needs is essential. To think about various kinds of community connections, clubs, clubs, memberships that a person might have. Many clubs stop, but then they've started, and so there's some new ways to look at how those go on. Volunteer opportunities, church and religious organizations, theater arts, virtual connections to friends and families, transportation opportunities, virtual social committees and groups. So um, some things um, for the way things were when there was more access and some um, options for with our more of a virtual life. There are also membership in community advisory boards. There's a comprehensive interest in vocational inventories and assessments that are key components to person-centered planning. So as we talked about the casual or the everyday kind of conversations, these might be tools that you might look to to get information. Um, also job experience and exposure opportunities. And then working with people on the development of soft skills. This is something that people have really been doing a lot of work on resumes, interviewing um, skills, and job searching. Really, the things that can be taught now, no matter what kind of restrictions we're dealing with. And then leveraging technology for competitive integrated employment opportunities. Many of our jobs have shifted and many jobs continue to shift. Um, and I just would reiterate one more time, um, you know, that it's important to remember communities referring to the places you live, you work, and you recreate. And it's not just um, a park or going downtown. The, the arena is much, much broader. And also that the strategies that we outlined are just examples because, again, you have to make sure they're adapted to the strategies that you use are adapted to fit each individual and the site needs. And um, reminding you again, it's foundational to good planning that the provider know what's important to the person, not just what's important for them. Um, you need to use various tools and processes for discovery with the person. So you should be, that should be part of every planning process and result in goals that are individualized, meaningful and achievable. There is also not a prescribed amount of time. This is often a question that we get. How much time should a person spend in the community? There's not a prescribed amount of time. The time should be as much or as little as the person expresses. Um, they want as they determine through the person-centered process. So through that planning process, you're going to get an idea of somebody really um, social and they want to make sure that in their home they have somebody to talk to when they go out, they're in, engaged with other people, or are they more of a loner and they don't really crave as much um, interaction with other people. It's incumbent upon the provider to ensure that the person has exposure to community activities and options so that they can make an informed choice. It's not acceptable to say the person has no ideas or interests. If that's what you're saying, then you don't know the person, you haven't worked with them closely enough and you haven't Lord, um, those avenues with them. 
for people who have um, documented preference to limit activities in the community, the provider should assist them engaging in, in activities and events that are consistent with their interests, but can be accessed remotely through technology, such as concerts that are streamed online or listening to podcasts, organizational meetings and social committees that can be attended virtually. We cannot reiterate enough that this pandem pandemic has shown us that community isn't only a physical place. There are countless numbers of virtual options to be involved in the community, especially in times when going out in the community isn't a realistic option. So I think, we again, you have to apply the um, rules and the approaches that you've applied to um, your own life. Connecting people to activities or groups within the community um, when they have an interest or are seeking membership. That could include examples of community connections such as interest groups as a card club, a car club, a charitable group, volunteer group, local, um, you know, volunteering when that is appropriate at local hospitals or nursing homes or even schools. Um, we talked a little bit about um, if a person might be interested in flowers or gardening, is there a garden club and how are they meeting not only now in this time of social distancing, but when there is an opportunity to be more um, involved um, outside of the home. Um, also church, a lot of church is really important to a lot of people. So what kinds of service groups or volunteer activities um, are there um, within their church um, that they might attend? And those can certainly lead to really meaningful connections and friendships. Also, local theater groups offer many opportunities beyond, beyond just the productions. There's painting things, um, you know, posting announcements of the event, selling, um, selling and taking tickets, assisting people in finding their seats. The possibilities are endless. We want to reiterate our previous statement. A lot of these groups can be accessed online. Also, I know I participate in a lot of um, streaming of activities, especially right now when meeting in person isn't the safest option for people, we can still be creative and find things to serve. Also, I just want to touch on employment because employment should be an option for all people. Everyone should be considered employable. People's interests and skills need to be assessed. People need to have exposure to real work through job experiences, job shadowing, for example. And if a person expresses an interest in a career which may not be obtainable for reasons um, that require educational degrees or certificates, et cetera, there uh, may be other realistic opportunities for um, the person in a career that similar has characteristics similar to that kind of um, job that they're interested in. And we should never rule out higher education and training for people. That is always an option, and I think it's one that is often overlooked. Thanks, Kathy. So yes. a question that we often get is up here on the next slide. I'm hoping you can answer this for us. So how is individual choice reflected in competitive integrated employment? So for that example, um, if an individual, I'll just use that a person wants to work um, retail, but they don't want to work weekends. Um, well, we need to explore with the person, why don't they want to work on the weekend? You know, what is that? Um, does that mean that they will miss certain activities that they really like? But could those activities be scheduled on other days, for example? We've also talked about, um, you know, that if a person is interested in um, law enforcement, what kind, what again is attracting them about that? <clears throat> Excuse me, dry throat here. Um, or for example, if someone wants to be a DJ but doesn't have the money to purchase the DJ equipment, a person um, could be supported to find a similar job to earn the money so that they could purchase that equipment. Um, it should be goal-oriented, work a job that's not a favorite to get to where you want to go. We all done that. We've all started um, somewhere maybe where we didn't think we wanted to end up. Um, and then also, um, not everyone may be interested in work, and this may be due to age, health, or other conditions. However, the pros and cons of work and various types of work should be discussed with the person, and interests should be assessed. 
So there's never just start from the negative that people don't work, always think that people could work and would be interested and then build from there, very important. Just gonna grab a drink of water. Choice of settings, again, we have the same um, layout here on this screen, challenges and barriers. Um, we listed non-disability specific settings for living, um, community integrated employment instead of segregated settings. And then we've listed on the side some strategies um, that some of which you may have employed and some which you may not have. But what kind of setting does the person want to live in and what are the options in the community? Are there options for people to have roommates who do not have disabilities? Has that been explored? Remember, people do not know what they do not know. So tours and visits to available options are important. Supporting people to try out a night in an apartment or an alternative setting is a, a good option to see if how they might like it. You know, again, I don't know that I don't like a certain thing, a food, a place, a, a thing, unless I've had exposure to it. Um, my first reaction might be, oh, I don't think so, but let's try it out for people. Um, as I said, employment should be an option for all people. Everyone should be considered employable. People's interests and skills need to be assessed. People need to have um, exposure to real work. Um, I think that job shadowing is something might again, might be a challenge at this point in time, but it is something that um, we certainly want to make sure people at, at a point where it is safe have that opportunity. And we need to ensure that people know and understand what options are available to them. Again, make sure that we're ruling in exploration and discovery and not just going based on what could be a person's limited experience and knowledge. Great. So we've received this question from people from various regional centers in California, um, from different trainings and through the inbox. So this question asks, if a person has been participating in the program or living in the home for a long time, how can we be sure that this is the setting they choose? And so we think it's really important that you make sure that options are provided to people on a regular basis, um, that they at least have the opportunity during their person-centered planning meeting, at least then, but on other occasions also, that people know what options are available to them. Even if they've been living in the home or participating in the program for longer than staff have been working there, staff don't always know if people chose that setting. So the main focus should be around ensuring that people are provided with options. So again, in conversation, talk about it. If a person expresses like, I'm tired of this place, I wanna get out of here. Well, what are you tired of? What would you like? What does that look like? Again, really having ongoing conversations, meaningful conversations and knowing the person that you're supporting is so very important to, to all of the person-centered planning aspects. And now I'm going to hand it off to Amanda. Thanks, Kathy. Um, another one of those uh, characteristics of a home and community-based setting that's outlined in the federal rule is the right to be treated well. So often, you know, there again, here are some of the challenges and barriers that we've seen, um, both in California, but then across the board, um, very common in these types of settings. So we often see uniform house rules, so a lot of blanket restrictions. Obviously, one of the current exceptions to that are the restrictions that, as Kathy pointed out, that we're all living under at this point um, as a result of COVID-19. So um, what we're really focusing on here, more across the board blanket restrictions that have been in place or would be in place with the exceptions of those guidelines that we're all living under at this point. Um, another common challenge is the environment looks like a facility or an institutional setting. Again, the goal is to be home or community-based. So it really should look like the individual's home if it's a residential setting. Um, individuals being supported to help plan menus, help grocery shop, um, just 
a lot of those restrictions that we see that are across the board, individuals are not really supported or permitted to participate in those types of activities. So any house rules, rules in a day setting should be discussed with each person. And if there's restrictions or modifications, then you should follow that process that Kathy pointed out. And those should be on an individualized basis and noted in that individual support plan. Um, rights restrictions should always be based on a plan to support the person to learn how to fully exercise their rights. Those restrictions should be periodically reviewed. Um, at a minimum, that should occur annually. People should have the opportunity to learn about things like voting, um, being supported to register to vote if they choose so. Um, again, what are those options, especially right now, if individuals are not um, permitted to go into the community and vote, looking at absentee ballots or anything that can be done to still help support and facilitate those choices. Um, one of the other common things that we see in settings is employee labor postings in common areas. So again, it looks more of like a, um, a workplace setting and things that should be removed from common areas and maybe kept in a staff office or something like that. Um, really kept in unobtrusive places. Um, we wouldn't have postings like this in our own home. So again, just keeping in mind that um, is this a place that you would want to live or that you would want to attend during the day. A couple other really good strategies that I know many settings have in place, especially for residential settings or an individual rights council. Um, it's a really good forum for individuals to come together and provide input to the setting on, um, you know, changes or, or ways that they'd like to be included in certain things. Um, again, just reinforcing, next slide please, the um, application or, or not the application of blanket restrictions. Um, often these are in place really as a matter of staff convenience and not really based on what the individuals in the setting need. So um, again, making sure that any house rules or rules within the day setting are discussed with individuals as a group. Um, we know we're currently living under the government enforced restrictions. So social distancing guidelines, health and safety restrictions. Um, it, you know, if individuals are now seeing staff in full PPE or individuals in public wearing masks, ensuring that we're explaining to individuals why those restrictions are in place and that we're all bound by those. Those are not things that we, you know, in order to align with the rule that you need to document in an individual plan, because again, we're all living under those types of rules. Um, However, with that being said, we should still be doing our best to explain those restrictions to individuals, what types of education and support are being provided to individuals so they understand what those restrictions that are and that those are not just in place for the individuals receiving services in your setting, but things that you and I are bound by also. Um, after the pandemic, so if there is a need for any sort of continued isolation or any, any concerned about the continued health and safety risks, such as wearing masks or PPE, restrictions on travel, visitors, any of those things that um, you feel need to stay in place once the more broad restrictions are lifted. Um, again, that goes back to that foundation of person-centered planning. So um, what is being done to make sure that that need is assessed on an individual basis and addressed through that approval process and documented in the person-centered plan. Thanks, Amanda. So this question asks, the setting provides a meal plan. How can we incorporate individual choice in the meal planning process? Um, again, going back to encouraging individual input. So we know there's a meal plan, but we also know that a lot of meal choices or preferences are um, cultural based. So, you know, we've seen examples where um, in California specifically, we had an individual that preferred Mexican style food because that's what his family had at home. So even though that setting had a predetermined meal plan, staff made sure that there were supplies on hand to make sure, you know, they can support that individual making the type of food that they wanted. Um, you know, is there ways to incorporate, again, individuals in determining what the menu is. So do they have a couple nights a week where they get to pick the type of food that they want? They can go to the grocery store, they can help plan the grocery list, et cetera. So encouraging that input, um, inviting people to come to the grocery store as appropriate, again, understanding the current restrictions and guidelines um, for your shelter in place order. Um, 
but any sort of opportunity there that you can collect that input. Um, it's also a good opportunity to work on money management and teaching skills, so like bagging groceries, um, budgeting for groceries, et cetera. All right. Another focus of the final rule is independence. So again, making sure that tasks are done, um, you're not completing tasks for people. They have opportunities to engage in um, doing their own household chores or um, at least learning to do those chores on their own, um, ensuring that all activities are not just done in a group setting. Um, one of the other common things that we've run across as a challenge is services, haircut, meal services, things that are being done in the home and not in the community. Um, I know a lot of times in settings, sometimes that is an individual choice for those services to be completed in the home. It is definitely a matter of convenience for individuals sometimes. Um, but making sure we're distinguishing between that convenience for the individual and being their choice versus staff convenience. Um, and ensuring if an individual is stating they want to go have their nails done, you know, downtown with a friend or a family member, et cetera, um, that we're supporting those opportunities as appropriate. Um, we know that supporting people to learn to do things, it, it's really important to their daily life and all, and an important aspect in all HCBS settings. So learning those tasks such as cooking, menu planning, grocery shopping, um, if an individual chooses to wear, helping them prepare their own lunch or teaching them the skills to prepare their own lunch, um, laundry, other household tasks, all critical components to learning to live independently, um, supporting people to have alone time um, and to independently access their community. What are the training techniques or technology things that you can put in place to help this, the individual um, be more independent in their daily life? In day programs, um, people can learn to check in, sign in, sign out, the start of the day and the end of the day, establishing um, kind of a form of accountability for task completion and engagement in the activities. Um, we know independence is different for each one of us. You know, what it looks like for myself is not what it's going to look like for Jamie or Kathy, um, and it works the same way for the individuals that are um, you're providing services to in your settings. So making sure that's determined by each individual's strengths, desires, needs, and again, listening to their input and what they're asking um, to do and um, all addressing all of that in the support in the context of support that is available and being provided. This question asks, if people choose to have services provided in the home rather than the community, is that in alignment with the final rule? Um, you know, it can be, as we've talked about, it's, it's really making sure that those are individual choices. Um, so, you know, we've seen examples where a person who received dental services in the home because the trip to the dentist and going in the dentist's office caused that individual an extreme amount of anxiety. Um, not my favorite place to go either. So, um, making sure that we're recognizing um, those fears, those anxieties, and we're supporting them. Um, However, making sure, again, going back to some of those modifications, that that modification is just not put in place and there's no additional education and support being provided to that individual um, to help them cope or maybe potentially learn or work through those anxieties to go to the dentist's office. Um, that person should always receive the support and have a plan in place to manage or reduce that anxiety um, or, or whatever you know the choice may be if their preference is to um, receive a certain service in the home, um, but also making sure they know there's an option to receive services in the community. Sometimes if you have a setting that, um, let's say you have a salon that's on site and everybody knows that they can access that setting on site, they also know that they, again, have that option to receive similar services in their community. Another characteristic of being in alignment with the HCBS final rule is ensuring individuals have a choice of services and support. Um, this really should be based on their interests and personal goals. So what directs them toward them living their own best life. Um, back to the example we gave about making sure people know that they have an option to receive services in the community. People don't know what they don't know. So if we're not explaining options to them, 
um, and opening those doorways for them and really letting them know you don't have to receive a certain service here. It doesn't have to be received in this context. Um, you know, that we really need to make sure that they're getting that type of information to make a real choice um, and not just a choice based on one activity or nothing. So it shouldn't be a limited menu, again, that might go back to staff convenience. Or, you know, you can participate in bingo or you don't get to do anything at all. Um, that's not real choice. So real choice is providing exposure to the possibilities of tasks that a person can choose from. Um, ongoing conversations about choice making sure someone else is not choosing for the person. Um, again, we we know sometimes that um, individuals are conserved or have another legal guardian in place that could impact that a, a certain individual's ability to make a choice solely by themselves. Um, but that doesn't negate the need for still including individuals in those conversations. Um, making sure that they're a part of their own meetings and they're a part of these conversations and afforded opportunities to give input. Um, again, this really goes back to those principles of making sure we are communicating with individuals um, and helping support them and how they want their day-to-day -day life to be. Thanks, Amanda. So speaking of communication, this question has come into the Q&A during this training. We received it in previous trainings. So I wanted to make sure we address this. How do we support individuals that are deaf, blind, or nonverbal to make individual choices? Um, I, I think this really starts with recognizing that all individuals communicate, even if it's not verbally. Um, I know even myself, you know, sometimes when I'm angry or feel a certain way, I don't always express myself verbally. You can recognize that through my mannerisms, the way I, you know, maybe I roll my eyes, maybe I have other facial expressions. So um, really getting to know individuals and the mode of communication that they use is really essential to that quality planning. So if you're working and supporting individuals on a daily basis, um, you know, do they use communication boards? Are there technology, again, body gestures, movements? How is that specific individual communicating their needs and preferences? Um, making sure that staff are, are trained and understand how each individual communicates. Um, back to that individualization. So what works for me may not work for the next individual. Some people um, may respond to communication boards. Some individuals may need technology or other aids in order to communicate. So if technology is a realistic option, making sure that that technology is obtained, the person and the staff are trained to use it, um, and then it's maintained in working order. If you have an individual that uses gestures, picture cards, communication boards for indicating their wants, needs, and preferences, um, again, making sure that staff are trained on that and recognizing um, what those needs are and ensuring they're con consistently looking for those when working with the person. Um, choice should not be based on what an individual can't do. Um, but be determined by the supports that can be provided to really assess that individual with their desired choice um, within the content of available resources. Uh, residential agreement. So this really just applies to residential settings. Um, this is one of those um, characteristics of a home and community-based setting that, again, you're not going to see in all setting types like a day program. Um, and really what this ensures that the, is that the individuals have an agreement or a lease in place, something that has the same protections as what anyone else in the community would have um, that doesn't own their own home. So if I'm renting a home, I'm signing a lease that affords, you know, affords protections to the landlord, um, but also affords me protections from somebody just removing me from the home with no notice or, or no reason, et cetera. So making sure that there's an agreement in place um, that affords those same types of protections. That may vary by locality. We know some um, counties or cities may have certain requirements in place for what should be contained within that document. Um, but again, it's really just making sure that there's something in place that the individual has signed um, and more importantly, has been educated on to understand what their rights are um, in, in signing that agreement. Um, some of those strategies, making sure that you're working with your regional center to make sure that your current agreement contains all elements of the final rule. Um, if you don't have agreements in place, 
uh, even more important to contact your vendoring regional center um, and, and see what help or support that they can provide you in there, um, such as providing a model or, or sample agreement that can be developed and provided. Those agreements should always be signed and dated by the individuals. Um, individuals should always have a copy of that lease. Um, and again, just re-emphasizing the fact that those agreements really shouldn't just be placed in front of an individual and ask them to sign. It's just like if you or I were signing any sort of document um, with terms and conditions, it's something that we really want to make sure we understand before we put our name to it. Thanks, Amanda. And this is another question that we have received from a previous training. Does the residence agreement meet the requirement for a legally enforceable lease agreement? Um, yes, it does. Um, but again, residents should also understand what that document is and educated on all of the information that's contained within the document. Privacy. Um, I know that this is a big one that comes up a lot. Um, some things that we see, um, have seen that may not um, immediately be understood or called to the attention of settings. Um, one of the main things I think that we've come across more often than not is medications being administered in public areas. So we've often seen this during meal times, um, dinner especially, where individuals will line up in the kitchen or line up in the dining room and all of their medication is just handed out to them. Um, we've also seen this through um, bedrooms and bathroom doors that don't lock or maybe only lock from one side. Um, you know, if, there, if it's doors to bedrooms, make sure that those can be lockable from the um, outside and people are provided the option of having a key. Um, if there are concerns or restrictions for an individual having a key, again, that goes back to the principles of a modification. Um, what is it about that particular individual that you feel that may need to be a modification? How has that been assessed? Um, making sure that that is documented in their support plan. But then again, you're also employing education um, and support to work toward the goal of the individual being able to maintain a key and, and unlock their own door. Um, we've also seen this, you know, in terms of privacy and individuals keeping their own valuables to them. Um, you know, we've heard from settings that say, oh, well, they can just keep it in their own bedroom. But there's not a secure place in their bedroom and their bedroom is not lockable from the outside. So it's only as secure um, if the individual's physically sitting in their room and can ensure their stuff is, you know, where it should be. But if an individual leaves the room, their bedroom does, door doesn't lock, that's not really ensuring that um, any of their, their valuables are secure. Um, same thing with keys to the home. If they're if it's a, a standard lock with a key or if there's a keypad, ensuring that individuals have a key to the home, they understand and can use the code for the keypad. Um, same thing again with a gate outside, um, ensuring that people have access and understand how to operate that. Again, unless there's some sort of documented restriction in place that um, where that individual might need some additional support um, to be able to use a key or again, a code. Um, the presentation of the option really must be documented in that support plan, again, visited on at least an annual basis. Um, this decision, whether it's lockable doors, whether it's um, codes to a keypad, all of, no, no decision should ever be final. Again, those should be revisited. It should be an ongoing education and support for the individual, always with the goal of trying to remove whatever modification is in place. Um, people should also be able to lock the bathroom door if they desire. Um, again, if this is restriction restricted, it has to be documented in the ISP and, and fully detailed as to why that restriction is in place for that specific individual. Um, this is probably one of those areas that, that we see most often that has blank, blanket restrictions where no bedroom door is locked from a certain way or things like that. Um, and again, those blanket restrictions really wouldn't be appropriate. It should be assessed and documented on an individualized basis. So in line with what you just said, Amanda, this question asks, how can we support someone with a severe allergy without posting it for all staff to see? Um, this really hinges on education and training of your staff. 
Um, it, it really shouldn't take a document posted for staff to understand that a particular individual has a severe allergy. Um, and really, you, you're expected to maintain that privacy for many reasons. But just as the family home wouldn't have that information posted, neither should a home or community-based setting. Um, that information should be recorded in the individual plan, shared with staff, other people in the home. Um, it, you know, and it can be shared with staff again without having it specifically posted somewhere. You know, we've been in settings where dietary restrictions are are posted on the refrigerator for everyone to see, and it has each individual's name and and states exactly what their dietary restriction is. Um, and, and those things really can be accomplished without having to have a piece of paper posted for everyone to know what those specific restrictions are. Um, all staff working in the home or the setting need to have a basic understanding of what those critical needs of a person are. So if it's an allergy, if it's a dietary restriction, every staff person that comes in and out of that um, setting should know that information. So before a person works in the home, um, this is one of the types of critical information that they should be trained on um, and also ensuring that that training is documented for the staff. Schedules and access to food. Um, we definitely see a lot of this and we know we get a lot of questions along these lines. Very common challenges or barriers are um, settings have meal times that are set. Um, so there's breakfast from 8 to 8.30, there's lunch from 12 to 1, there's dinner from 5 to 6, and there's absolutely no flexibility in any of those times. Um, same thing, breaks, snacks are only included at very set specific times. Um, so start thinking through some of those strategies where you can really accommodate individuals, again, more on an individualized basis. What are their needs requests? Knowing that most of us don't always eat meals or want snacks or take breaks at the same time every day. Um, so doing your best to ensure that people living in the home have the flexibility in those meal times. Um, maybe they're not hungry for breakfast. Maybe they don't want dinner at the exact time that's set. Um, so ensuring that individuals have, an access, have access to a comparable meal um, at the time that they do prefer. Um, People should always have free access to food and snacks, again, unless you have some sort of a documented medical condition for that particular individual where you would restrict their access to food. Um, we know there's multiple types of medical conditions that individuals can have um, to where you want to make sure that they're not just eating certain things or eating all hours of the day or night. Um, but again, going back to that foundation of person-centered planning, that's an individualized need that should be documented on an individualized basis. Um, we shouldn't see locks on refrigerators or anything like that that results in a blanket restriction for all individuals in the setting because some individuals may need some additional support or, or modifications. Um, regarding access to snacks, um, if asking staff is the only way that individuals can, can access food, that also is not an acceptable strategy um, and would not be um, supported in alignment with the final rule. Thanks, Amanda. So this question asks, how do we balance the requirements of the final rule with health and safety concerns? Um, you know, health and safety is always paramount. Um, CMS does afford states this flexibility in addressing individual needs regarding health and safety. Um, CMS does understand that some individuals may need specific protections or procedures in place to assure that their health, safety, and well-being um, is being met. CMS emphasizes that person-centered planning is the heart of the home and community-based services setting final rule, and it's the foundation for any support services and in interventions for the individual. Um, the balance between health and safety with person-centered practices should be discussed at the individual's person-centered planning meeting. Um, for example, if you have an individual that has diabetes and they say that his or her favorite food is chocolate or candy and they want to eat that at every single meal, um, making sure that you're discussing that at the meeting, identifying some strategies or solutions to balancing that individual's desire with those health concerns. Um, you know, identifying training, education, anything that may be necessary for the individual to understand what those restrictions are and why they're in place, not just telling the individual, nope, sorry, you can't have that because you're diabetic. 
um, it, it really should go beyond that. Um, again, just like you or I, how would you want to be treated? How would you want information explained to you by your physician or anyone that might be putting a restriction or perceived restriction on how you want to make choices for your own life? Um, as a team, as part of those meetings, you could brainstorm with everyone about other food options that the individual likes. Um, you know, what are some of the options if it is chocolate? Is there sugar-free chocolate or, or, you know, what are some of those choices that the individual could have and possibly have some independence in accessing without compromising their health? Um, right to visitors. I know this is, um, always a uh, you know pretty hot topic that we um, see when we're visiting uh, settings and in particular right now understanding that there are um, restrictions that we're all living under with um, people being able to just come visit at any point um, pre-covid there were still challenges and barriers with people not having places to meet privately with their guests or having um, very defined visiting hours. So individuals were not allowed to stay, have visitors overnight or past certain times of day, et cetera. So um, in order to be in alignment with the final rule, people should be able to have visitors at their homes at times that they prefer. Um, they should be able to visit with their those individuals in private. So whether it's their um, personal bedroom, whether it's a common place, wherever that individual chooses, um, that shouldn't be prohibited. Um, if the person shares a room with somebody, then communicating that individual working with their roommate and coming to an agreement at, you know, what's appropriate, times are appropriate, et cetera. Um, practices and rules around visitors should be set with the individuals living in the home. And again, it goes back to that education and support. How is this being explained to individuals? Um, do they understand what their options are for those private spaces, including their own bedroom? Um, we do know the restriction on visitation during the stay-at-home order for each individual residential setting will look different depending on many factors. So that in particular includes the number of people that are living in the home, um, as well as goals, desires, needs, et cetera, for the, the other individuals in the home. Um, ensure like during this time that those discussions are held with the staff and with um, the residents of the setting. So again, if you are restricting visitors at this point because of the stay at home order, making sure that that's explained to individuals in that way. So they understand that it's a result of an order that we're all living under right now and not just a restriction that the setting is choosing to put in place. Um, keeping in mind though, also, again, since we're all, you know, we can't really have visitors to our own homes. We all have these restrictions. What are we doing to make sure that we're still facilitating um, communication with others outside of our home. Um, you know, if you can't go meet a friend, then are you using FaceTime? What types of other technology or communication sources can you put in place to still give individuals opportunities to communicate with people that may be important to them? So Amanda, you were addressing this head on, but just want to ask again, how do we allow visitors during the COVID-19 pandemic? And again, you know, this pandemic that we're all navigating right now is an unprecedented event. Um, and we know it's essential to each person's health and safety to make sure that we're maintaining certain protections. Um, <clears throat> so obviously there's very defined, strict and unusual limits on person to person contact at this point. Um, going back to my previous point about making sure you're educating individuals as to why those restrictions in place. Um, I think Kathy also pointed out very well understanding what that individual's definition of community is um, and thinking through those virtual options. So leveraging technology, virtual visits, Zoom, um, what what can be done at this point to, to still, even though someone can't necessarily come into your setting or come into that individual's home, what can still be done to facilitate communication and, and visit with people that, um, you know, they care about and they want to communicate with. Um, if you have any further questions on um, any of the COVID-19 guidance or additional information that has been issued by the California Department of Public Health, um, any changes, updates that have been made to accessibility services, et cetera, um, those can be found in the directives posted on DDS's website. Uh, 
Um, one of the last characteristics of a home and community-based setting that we're going to touch on today is accessibility. So um, this is really thinking through what are there are, are there any physical barriers in the home or the setting that make certain places inaccessible to individuals with disabilities. Um, kitchens, laundry rooms, staff only rooms, et cetera. Um, where are individuals um, restricted from accessing and, and what is the foundation of those restrictions? So if people have limited mobility for any reason, um, the setting should ensure that individuals can move freely about their home or day setting and access all common areas that others can without limited mobility. Um, for safety reasons, this should mean that people have at least two options for egress, um, just in case one option is blocked. We get a, a pretty common question about fences um, outside of the setting. Um, there's nothing wrong with having a fence, especially you know if it's it's a residential setting, if it's an individual's home. A lot of us have fences outside of our home. Um, it, it really boils down to the function of the fence. So is it a fence like other people have in the neighborhood around their homes, or does that fence serve as a barrier or intended to restrict movement for individuals? Um, that's when it could become a little bit problematic and may not align um, with the intent of the final rule. So ensuring that locks, gates, latches, um, all of those things are functional and can be operated by individuals that are on site. Um, accessibility to people, places, things are currently in place. And really just explain to people in the context of the public health crisis. So, it, you know, at this point with the shelter in place orders, if individuals are not allowed to access the community, again, we are educating and supporting them as to why those restrictions in place and their understanding that it's not because of your particular setting or because of that particular individual, it's it's an order that we're all currently um, bound under at this point. Um, virtual accessibility barriers. So is there limited access to technology or technology infrastructure? Um, making sure that we're addressing those. Um, you know, understanding again, we don't have a lot of the the face to face opportunities and engagement um, and access that that we would all like to see. Um, so, what uses of technology can be explored as an option to um, address any sort of accessibility issue that you're facing. This question we have received through the Q&A on the training today, and we've received it in the past, so I wanted to make sure we address this one. How do we balance the HCBS settings final rule with state licensing requirements in California? Um, anytime that there's conflicts between state and local licensing requirements and the HCBS settings final rule, um, those conflicts do need to be identified. Um, so working with DDS and CCL, um, those entities will um, analyze these requirements, they're responsible for these requirements, and then remediating any areas that are in conflict. Uh, in conflict. Um, until you hear otherwise, um, make sure that you're conforming to your licensing requirements. Um, DDS is having ongoing conversations about this, um, and as those areas are identified and they're working through any changes, those will obviously be communicated to everyone. All right, we'll talk a little bit about next steps. So, um, you know, Jamie mentioned where California is at this point um, in their overall compliance process and, and making sure that all settings are coming into alignment with the final rule. Um, so what we, you know, you most of you have completed a self-assessment at this point, which gives us that as is picture of where each setting is with regard to meeting the requirements of the final rule. Um, based on the assessment, each provider is going to have the opportunity with technical assistance to develop an action plan to address any areas that they um, self-identified as, as needing to you know, work on or improve in order to ensure that you're coming into alignment. Um, that plan will be reviewed and approved um, and will kind of serve as the blueprint, so to speak, um, to ensuring that each setting is achieving that alignment. The implementation of the plan will be validated and verified verified as part of the on-site assessment process or as part of ongoing quality reviews. Um, site assessments will be conducted for a um, random uh, sample of those settings um, that are located throughout the state. So um, 
approximately 1,200 settings will be identified in that initial sample. Um, and then additional information would be forthcoming about any setting that didn't did not complete a, a self-assessment. Um, I think the thing to emphasize the most with remediation is um, remediation, you don't have to wait for a certain date to, to begin, um, especially if you completed a self-assessment and you've identified some of those areas, you can start working on those now. Um, as soon as you've identified those, any of those areas. So that just gives your setting more opportunity and time um, to work on those areas of improvement. Moving forward from here, um, settings will receive an assessment and a compliance report. Um, state and regional centers will be providing ongoing technical assistance, um, helping you understand remediation. What are some of these strategies we've talked about today? Um, maybe there were challenges or barriers that we didn't mention today that your settings facing. So making sure that technical assistance is being provided to help you develop those strategies to remediate any of those challenges or barriers that you're facing. Um, again, ongoing, the, there will be additional trainings, technical assistance and guidance that will be forthcoming as needed. Resources, I know we alluded to this um, relatively early on in this. Um, if you have questions about the final rule, um, any general questions, feel free to direct those to your vendoring regional center. Um, any HCBS questions related to the statewide transition plan can be sent to DDS at hcbsregs at ddsca.gov. Um, here is a list of some other resources. When we send this PowerPoint out after the presentation, these are hyperlinks, so you will be able to click these directly. Um, CMS's website is always a good resource. There's the full final rule. Um, you can access CMS's guidance around heightened scrutiny. So if you completed a self-assessment and maybe you self-identified as possibly um, falling into one of those heightened scrutiny categories, um, this is another good resource for information and some federal policy guidance that was released. Um, California Statewide Transition Plan is posted to the DHCS website. Again, this is a direct link there. Um, that plan includes how California has approached the settings rule, um, and also include some of those steps for assessing compliance. And lastly, California's DDS website. So um, we mentioned the HCBS regulation, any information related to this process is posted there, um, as well as updates and directives related to any of the state home orders. I'll turn it back over to Jamie. Thanks, Amanda. I'm gonna go back to this slide, actually, the questions about the final rule. Um, I'm excited that we do have some time to take some of the questions. We've been seeing all the questions come in through the Q&A. We have the whole list that was submitted through training registration. So at this time, we're gonna answer some of those questions. So um, I'll ask the question and then Amanda and Kathy, feel free to jump in. And then Susan, if you wanna add anything on behalf of DDS, um, please do so. So the first question that came in through registration asks, how to accommodate the HCBS final rule with limited resources? For example, if you have one car um, or a small budget, how might you approach that? This is Kathy. I'll just jump in and say, again, it isn't about how large or small your budget is. I think it is managing the resources you have, but it starts with having an adequate, and when I mean adequate, I mean a good person-centered plan um, and knowing the person and then in some ways negotiating. What are those, um, how do you implement things and how do you make it work within of a budget and um, the, those sorts of things. So I think that it really, um, I know it can be challenging and maybe it means people take turns on doing cer certain things, but um, I think that that person-centered plan and talking with the person and understanding frequency, that kind of thing is also very important. Oh, and Susie, I'm going to look at you. Hopefully, I didn't say anything that really violates the way you want to go. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. The next question asks um, if there are any ideas on how to do job coaching remotely, any ideas on um, how to be effective with that uh, remotely, virtually, uh, as we're, you know, living in the COVID-19 virtual world right now. Uh, 
Um, again, this is Kathy. I'll just start and Amanda, if you've got something, but um, I know that for job coaching, they also, I'm aware of opportunities where people don't really want the job coach present on the job site. And so they have done it via check-ins, like via over FaceTime or phone call or text messages back and forth to see what kind of support the person wants, needs, or how the is just going for the person. Um, I think that there, the other thing is to think about um, how can you, in another situation, do some role playing about situations or, or um, challenges that a person might face on the job. And so, you know, do a facsimile of the environment if that's possible. Those are just a few ideas. I don't know, Amanda, if you've got other things to add. No, I think that was pretty much it, you know, and I think it goes back to your point earlier about some of those soft skills, too, that can be worked on and just understanding that, you know, while you can't be um, in person at a lot of places working on some job shadowing or things like that, what are some of the things that you can still work on, as you mentioned, virtual options, things like that in the interim to help um, ensure individuals are prepared for the time where they can go back to, you know, physically on site working in a place. Great, thank you both. Um, this question asks about conservatorship and Amanda, you started talking about that and I know we had a question come through today, but it, the question basically gets at if there are any contradictions or challenges with the final rule um, against conservatorship. So uh, I guess, Amanda, if you wanna start and talk about that, um, again, I know you talked about that, but if you wanna just you know, speak to that again. Yeah, I can touch on it a little bit. I know Kathy, I think, always explains this really well. You know, we know it, there's nothing specifically defined in the federal language of the final rule that that speaks directly to conservators. Um, it's really about ensuring and facilitating individual choice. Um, but again, understanding that sometimes there's a legal implication there um, if somebody is in place to make decisions on behalf of individuals. So we kind of talked a little bit about some of those strategies about still including individuals in those conversations. Um, I don't know, Kathy, if you wanna speak to conserv conservatorship more um, specifically or directly. Um, thanks, Amanda. Um, I think it's important, one, to know specifically what does the conservatorship cover? Is it financial matters? Is it medical decisions? Is it um, how broadly is it written? How, what specifically does it address? And I think that while there may be another um, person who is ultimately making decisions, it still doesn't, does not negate the importance of having people involved in conversations and participating to the extent that it is possible possible for them. Sorry, that word suddenly tripped me up. But to the extent possible that a person can participate and express their desires. And as a provider, if there's a difference in opinion between the person and the conservator, you may end up playing a role of a bit of a mediator or a moderator between to make sure they're hearing each other and they understand those reasons. So I think that that's significantly important. Um, all, all of those points are really important to make sure you explore and understand. This next question asks, um, are they, is the HCBS final rule going to be implemented with the same timeline as originally set, um, or has it been changed at all because of the pandemic or other reasons? So I think I can touch on this initially from a CMS perspective and then I'll turn it over to Susie to highlight some things from a DDS perspective. Um, I would highlight, so CMS has been clear that the extension through 2023 is really to afford providers more time to work through the remediation process. Um, again, you know, CMS's goal with the final rule, DDS's goal, all of our goals is to work toward ensuring that all settings have an opportunity to fully align with the final rule. Um, so at least from a CMS perspective, that was the intent of that extension. Um, I don't know, Susie, if you wanna talk to anything specific related to DDS's timeline. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. I mean, I, I think that that I don't have too much to add to that, except that, you know, the department remains committed to um, bringing services into alignment with these final rules. 
um, and working with regional centers throughout the next couple years, as well as providers on what that transition and remediation looks like. Uh, and so, you know, as we've talked about through these next steps, and as you guys saw in some of those charts that we um, went through a little bit earlier in the training, um, the assessment of services uh, has already started and will continue throughout the next year. And, um, and then after that is, is that transition period. So as Amanda spoke to that, that is really what that extension was, was given is um, essentially an extra year for providers to uh, have time to transition their services. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Susie. Um, this next question came through the Q&A on this training. Who is ultimately responsible for ensuring provider compliance? Is it DDS, regional centers, um, or the federal government? I'll let you, I don't know if you want to start that one, Susie, or you want me to? <laughs> um, I mean, I think we'll, we'll likely say the same thing. Ultimately, um, it's the state's responsibility, right? I mean, we have um, accountability of Medicaid dollars, and um, that is, is what the federal government um, was applying these rules to. And so ultimately, it's the state, but really um, with the intent of these rules being um, very much about person-centered planning and opportunities for different services. Um, I think it falls on, on everybody, um, uh, you know, service providers, regional centers, advocates, individuals served, family members, um, all of us to, to apply these, these rules to um, our lives and the lives of those we serve. But yes, ultimately um, the department, the state's responsibility to be in compliance. Thanks, Susie. Um, this question asks, how do we know exactly if we are in compliance or not? I think that's probably another question uh, <laughs> for DDS. Amanda, I'm seeing your face here. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and I think it, certainly feel free to chime in, Amanda, if you have um, anything to add to this, but, um, you know, so we've started that transition, or sorry, that um, assessment process um, just last month. So August 31st, uh, as Jamie reviewed at the beginning of our training here today, that uh, providers who are required to be in compliance with these rules um, were required to complete a self-assessment uh, to determine sort of an initial level of uh, compliance or alignment with the rules. So how are services provided now? Um, and where is there room for transition? And so to know um, whether or not somebody's in compliance or not, you know, there'll be continued review. We'll be validating those assessments through desk review as well as site assessments uh, and working with regional centers and providers to determine a um, you know, to determine what is needed to be done to say that you are in compliance with these rules. Thanks, Susie. I'm going to direct the next question um, to Kathy. We talked about virtual accessibility as part of accessibility, and this question asks, how can we best support people who cannot meet with or who may not have access to um, certain technologies like Zoom or FaceTime or some of the other platforms we've mentioned? I think um, it's a good question because I think that one thing we've learned through this crisis is that technology um, and the requirements that support technology such as access to the internet and things like that are not as widely available as we would hope that they are. So I think one is, um, in the interim, when that technology is not available, um, hopefully everyone has access to some good old fashioned, like a phone of some sort, even if it's a landline, um, if that is possible, or by social distancing safely to support a person, of course, that's important. And then I think it is really talking with um, the 
your own agency with your regional center, et cetera, about what are the options to get technology so that it is available to people. I think there have been lots of not only service organizations, but states that have put together programs that um, have created some lending libraries, if you will, for technology kinds of supports and even um, service groups, those kinds of things. So it's important to start with what you have, but then do that exploration. Um, and I don't know, Amanda, I know this is an area you might have some ideas, or Jamie, I know you've done a lot of research on this also. No, Kathy, I thought that was great. I don't have anything to add. I don't know, Jamie, as Kathy mentioned, Jamie, you've done a lot of research in that, so. Yeah, I mean, I think virtual accessibility is definitely one of the barriers that it's always been a barrier, but I think the COVID-19 pandemic is really bringing that to light for a lot of people. Um, and there is a lot of research being done on that, both for in the education system, for people receiving um, services. So I think right now it really comes down to being creative. You know, we talked about if you have limited resources, um, well, how can we be creative within that budget that we do have? Um, mm -hmm. Or how can we be creative? And, you know, it's not just about um, the platforms themselves, but having, like Kathy has said, access to the good old phone. It doesn't need to be, um, you know, a fancy tablet or a piece of technology. Um, and I think there's going to be um, a lot coming out because of the pandemic now to uh, trying to improve access to a lot of these devices and technologies as well. So. Um, again, I think it comes down to creativity. It comes down to uh, communication and talking with people and what they want to access and, you know, making sure they know what those options are. And just one thing I would add quickly is um, I participate in a process um, where we've really been exploring a lot of different ideas about what does it mean with the isolation that people have experienced as a part of the pandemic. But one of the things is that people have started saying at the very beginning, because we started this in, I think, April, um, of saying, you know, people don't have the skills to use technology. They don't know how to use it. They won't understand it. And one of the resounding um, areas of feedback that we've received is people really do pick up on it. Um, people have learned to use technology and that um, every time staff, and these are this is coming from direct support professionals who have said they have just been amazed, if you will, that how quickly people are able to learn it because it's important and that um, maybe the training takes some additional time or takes a little bit longer or it requires you to really um, think about it in a very, um, you know, step by step fashion. But it's so important to not, again, not assume that people can't do it. Assume competence and, and train toward achieving that. I think the last thing I would add to that is looking within your own community as to what resources may be available. Um, you know, a lot of communities, there's been grant funding and, and opportunities that have um, come available to help support organizations um, get access to, you know, whether it's a better internet service, whether it's tablets, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would suggest starting from there. I know somebody, um, in the Q&A box actually just dropped a um, website for a nonprofit that's dedicated to helping provide these levels of support. So there, there is information out there. Um, it, it, you know, may not be easily found within your community, um, but there are definitely more and more opportunities becoming available to, to gain access to additional um, technology resources. Um, the next question relates to visitors and this can really be, you know, in person visitors when that is allowed or, um, you know, virtual visitors if people want to have, you know, FaceTimes or, or Zoom. Can people have any visitor that they want come to the home? Can they have um, FaceTime with any person that they want? Um, there have been a few questions about that, so I'm going to kind of summarize it in that way. But I think if we could just speak a little bit more to um, visitors. And I know there was also a question, do all visitors need to be fingerprinted? Um, so I think we can address some of those. 
Yeah, I think I would, you know, start speaking generally. Yes, individuals should be able to meet with, visit with any one of their choice. Um, you know, we often hear from settings that they don't want individuals to have a boyfriend or girlfriend or significant other in their own room in private. Um, and that's not a restriction that would be in place in, you know, anybody else in the community. That's not a restriction that's in place as part of their home. So again, unless there is a, a documented assessed need as to why a certain individual should not have access to a visitor of their choice or visiting with um, someone of their choice in private, um, there, there really shouldn't be any reason for those types of restrictions. Um, understanding that, that maybe there is a legal reason or something like that to why a, a certain individual may not be able to visit a location um, you know, those things should absolutely still be addressed again on an individualized basis um, and not be the foundation for blanket restrictions or generalized practices like visiting hours or defining um, types of individuals that, that can be visitors. I know, Kathy, I'm sure you have a lot to add to this too. <laughs> No, I, I completely agree. I think that the whole issue is if there's some kind of legal restriction, you know, that a person cannot be coming to the home, um, the, and the whole issue of fingerprinting, I'm going to let Susie um, address, but um, because of um, that may be a requirement within California. But I also agree that as far as the time goes and that kind of thing, again, talking with the person who's being supported and if the if they have a friend or a family member, whatever, who wants to call them at three o'clock in the morning and that disrupts their sleep, then, you know, I obviously engage with that person and work with them so that it's something that is more reasonable and not disruptive to the person, even if it's putting, you know, the phone, um, I, you know, so that it goes mute after a certain time of the evening so that the person can't be disturbed if you have somebody who's a violator of it. But again, it, I think it, we go back to relying on common sense and making sure that people, if they are expressing a desire to have a person come, why, what is that reason? How do they do it in a safe and healthy way? way um, and if there are modifications that need to be made again doing those with the person so um, I, I just think that it, it again is conversation and important to really understand the reasons thanks Kathy um, I want to kind of wrap up the questions one final question um, which sums up a lot of questions that have come in specifically around person centered planning. You know, we've talked about the importance of it, how it's the foundation to the final rule. People have asked, you know, what additional resources are there? So I first want to address that um, and let everyone know that we are working with support development associates and um, the Department of Developmental Services to roll out additional training specifically to person centered planning um, to help with some of those discovery skills. Um, because, you know, we keep saying it comes back to person centered planning, but there's so much more to that uh, around discovery important to and important for um, and using a lot of tools that are already out there have already been developed. I know a lot of regional centers are already doing trainings on that. So in terms of additional resources, be on the lookout for some of those trainings. Um, in addition to asking your regional centers what um, resources already exist, because there are a lot of person centered planning resources already out there that um, you can access. And I guess I want to see if anyone else has final thoughts around um, person centered planning, how to approach it right now in this virtual time. Um, I know we've talked about that, but any other final thoughts specific to that? Oh, I would just say, you know, I think that sometimes traditionally we've thought about person-centered planning as it's a document and we have, we do that document, but then we don't put all of those practices in place and into practice. And I think during this time of socially distancing and people spending more time at home, 
when you start really thinking about the time that you have to converse with a person or um, you know be with them is a great opportunity to really get to know them and learn about them um, better. Um, so it just I, I think that there are many, many downsides to what has happened to all of us as a result of this pandemic. There's also an upside of really that whole getting to know a person better, which means mm -hmm. that um, services and the supports that you're providing are going to be more individualized and that will play out in the way that plan is developed and what it states and what the person is focusing on because you should have a better idea of what really is important to them as well as what's important for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would just add, you know, a, a especially right now, as Kathy pointed out, it's even more critical to have those conversations. Um, but, you know, we've been in a lot of settings. I've talked to a lot of staff that provide services. And um, I think if they haven't previously been trained in person-centered approaches or person-centered planning, um, there's a lot of staff that are already doing those things on a daily basis. They just don't formally recognize it as person-centered planning. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of involved staff that that have conversations very often with individuals. They get to know individuals very well. They understand their needs, their likes, their dislikes, how they communicate. Um, so it really, really boils down to that documentation piece. Um, you know, as Kathy mentioned, it, it's more than just a document. But if you're already having those conversations, um, really just getting that put on paper does, does play an important role in it. Um, and again, right now, really having those conversations about community. So what does it look like for the individual? What really is important to them? Um, what are they missing by not being able to access their community or have visitors? Um, you know, what are those things that are really important to them and, and make them happy on a daily basis? Um, and going back to some of those things that we talked about for individuals that, that maybe aren't verbal, um, still looking for those cues, using communication boards, whatever, um, that individual may use to communicate and, and ensuring even more that you're having those conversations um, and, you know, looking for resources either within your community about access to, to internet or technology or, or whatever the circumstances may be. I think, you know, Kathy said it best when she said it doesn't have to be fancy technology. It can be a landline. It can be as simple as, you know, picking up a phone and, and, and having a conversation if that's what will, um, you know, connect an individual to someone else, but just making sure that you're um, exploring all of those resources and options and really just having those conversations. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so speaking of additional resources, there have been some questions asking about that. So um, we shared these links and then before we get to the exit survey, I also just wanted to show at the end of this training, we have a list of common terms. We include these in all of our trainings with California DDS um, because, of course, we speak in acronyms. Um, so we spell those out and give some definitions here. So when we send out the um, slide content, you'll have access to all of these. Um, you know, throughout the training, we talked about a lot of these. We, you know, use those acronyms. Um, so just wanting to make sure that you all know this is an additional resource that you can circle back to. Um, before I put the exit survey up, Susan, I wanna see if you have anything else to wrap up, close the training, um, and then from there, I will share the exit survey. I don't, I just wanna, you know, again, thank everybody for their time and, and thank you all, um, PCG, for, for giving such great information today. And um, I think Jamie, you've already touched on this, but you know, um, this training is has been recorded, and uh, we will be putting that up on the department's website, uh, as well as offering a translation of the training. So that will be up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so for this exit survey, there are two different options. Well, I guess three different options on how to take it. Um, you can either copy this URL into your browser and take it there. You also can open up your camera on a mobile device and scan um, the code on the screen and that will bring up the exit survey on your phone. Um, and then we can also put it in the Q&A here. Um, I'm actually gonna ask Elsa, if you wanna respond to someone within the Q&A and just put that link in there, um, you can copy it from the PowerPoint. Um, if you're unable to take it right now, we will also send it out um, when we send out 
the slide deck to everyone. Um, but we'll keep it up here on the screen for a few minutes in case you do want to scan the code or copy the link. Um, but otherwise, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, we really enjoyed, uh, you know, virtually having this training with you all, um, going through the content, hopefully answering some of the questions that you've had um, so that you're better prepared to, um, you know, with these strategies to align services with the final rule. So thank you, everyone. Again, we'll leave this up on the screen and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie.